Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, guess who's being taxed less than they used to be? Our guest, Bob Lord, is an associate fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, where he focuses on the relationship of tax law to inequality. He was co-author of a recent briefing paper that found that taxes on the rich are one-sixth of what they used to be. Bob Lord, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks. Good to be here. Thanks for doing the work you're doing and for coming on. Uh, so just to start with this, who who exactly is taxed less and, and why? How did that happen? <laughs> well, what my, uh, my colleague Chuck Collins and I looked at is the top 0.01% of the country in wealth. This is the top one out of every 10,000 households. And what we did is look at what they're paying in tax as a percentage of their wealth over time. And what we found is between 1953 and 2018, uh, their rate of tax as a percentage of their wealth decreased by five sixth so they're now paying one sixth of what they used to pay and this happened because of a number of changes in in laws to inheritance taxes and income taxes and yes I, I, and this is based on 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 data that's been compiled by emmanuel says and and gabriel zuckman two um economists at um uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, so we're relying on their data, but they're very, very good. And what they did is they looked at all taxes, state sales tax, corporate tax, excise taxes, uh, state and gift taxes, and they attributed those taxes to who ultimately bears them. Um, you know, the cor corporation pays tax, really the shareholders are indirectly bearing that burden. And they allocated all these taxes out. And we took what they found as the taxes that the various groups are paying. And, and we focused on the top 0.01% because that's, that's the very, very top. Uh, and then we couldn't, we didn't, we were not able to say, they paid this percentage of their wealth back in 1953 and this different percentage in 2018. But we were able to figure out what the relationship of those two percentages were. And the relationship is that in 1953, it was six times as much as a percentage of wealth as, as now. Yeah, pretty stunning. Um, and uh, I imagine what you know of the trends since 2018, uh, and including during this uh, disease pandemic, uh, there's not been a lot of uh, wealth movement uh, from the super wealthy to those who need it. it. It hasn't gotten better because you identify two key factors. One is um, the, the Trump Tax Act was only just beginning to take, take effect in 2018. So in 2018, a lot of the tax that was being paid was based on the law prior to 2018. 2018 made the tax law even better for the very, very wealthy. And then of course, with the pandemic, there are just monstrous gains at the very, very top. Um, the billionaires have, have increased their wealth by, I think over a third, uh, just in a year. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely stunning. But this is the culmination of changes in the tax law that have been going on really since, since the 70s, but certainly since 1980, where we've been taxing wealth less and work more. And so if we're taxing wealth less, you know, dividends, capital gains, the, the types of income that folks with wealth generate, we're taxing that less then they're going to be paying a whole lot less as a percentage of their wealth. Yeah. And, and Bill, when you talk about billionaires, that's an even smaller group than the group we were talking about earlier, right? It, it is. The billionaires are only 650 or so people. Smaller than that top 0.01%. The top 0.01%, I think that the entry point for that is someone has to have wealth of, I 
think it's around 200 million or so. It might be a little bit less. It might be closer to 100 million. So they're really, really wealthy. They're not billionaires. However, if you look at the average wealth in that top 0.01%, it is very close to a billion dollars. Because yeah. it also includes the, the, the Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk's. Right. Uh, there, there is, uh, there is a bill in Congress uh, for a wealth tax. Uh, what do you make of of that proposal and of and of other proposals, whether or not uh, introduced in legislation? I, I think the wealth tax proposal, which is uh, Elizabeth Warren, Pramila Jayapal, and I believe Brendan Boyle have proposed this. It's a, it's a very, very uh, good proposal, because here's the thing, David. You know, when, when you or I pay income tax, it impacts our life decisions like how hard we work, how long we work until you retire, when our, whether our spouse needs to work, all sorts of things like that. When we pay sales tax, especially on a high ticket item like a car, it impacts what we buy, how much we can buy. When the very, very, very rich pay any other kind of tax, the only function it has is as a wealth tax. It doesn't impact their decisions like on, on how much they work or what kind of job they take or when they retire or what they buy. They buy whatever they want. They do whatever work they want to do. And they live wherever they want in however large or small a house they want to live in. So the only impact any tax has is on their wealth. And so why not go ahead and measure their taxes according to where the taxes are impacting them? Because the bottom line is that if the, if the very, very wealthy are being taxed fairly, wealth stops accumulating at the top. And so what we want to do is measure the tax according to wealth and tax the wealth enough so that we that we stop having this concentration of wealth at the very top. Uh, it, when you look at just the past history since 1980, it's it's unbelievable. This this group, this top 0.01 percent, they have four times the share of the nation's wealth as they did back in 1980. They've gone from a little under two and a half percent to a little under 10 percent of the nation's wealth. So this is one out of every 10,000 people having 10% 10, 10 of the country's wealth. They're 1,000 times as wealthier, as wealthy as the average person. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you don't mention that the taxes that billionaires or anybody else pays, uh, and I think this is a very American thing not to mention, has any impact on what we get out of the government in terms of public services. I mean, with, with over half of this money going into wars and preparations for other wars, uh, we, we don't always think of taxes as getting us something in return uh, the way that I imagine thinking of them if I lived in Scandinavia or some parts of Europe or Asia where you, where you pay taxes and you get the billionaires to pay their taxes. And you, and you get something back for them. Uh, it, it, doesn't this have a little bit to do with people's uh, dislike of taxes in the United States? I suspect it does, because you, you're right. Um, in, in Scandinavia, folks aren't as resistant to paying tax because the government does a lot of good stuff. I think we're starting to see that just last week with the passage of the uh, COVID relief bill, bill which... Uh, the reports are it's going to take one half of children who are living in poverty right now out of poverty. It's not enough, but it's a good start. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a start. Um, what, what about what about other possibilities to reverse the trend, such as a financial transaction tax? I think there's a bill uh, to do that in Congress or taxation on corporations or taxation on super high incomes or taxation on huge inheritances uh what's the what's the best combination of of changes that would that would turn things in the opposite direction i think that i, I think they're, they're all good proposals and they're not they're not mutually exclusive it's not that we're going to pick one and go with it 
The financial transactions tax has a benefit separate and apart from you know, financing the government is that it will stop the crazy speculative trading on Wall Street. It's a tiny little tax. I think it's a 0.1%, 0.1% tax on, on a financial transaction. So someone who's making a legitimate investment is, is, is not going to be impacted in the slightest. But someone who's you know, buying and selling and buying and selling 4 million times a day, well, they're going to get hit pretty hard. They're going to have to stop functioning that way. So that has, like I said, a, a benefit all its own. Uh, the estate and gift tax system, uh, I've actually been personally doing a lot of work on that lately. And it is, uh, it's an optional tax at this point. Even billionaires can hire high-priced lawyers and accountants and avoid the tax entirely. And this is a whole separate problem of what we call dynastic wealth, where wealth is accumulated by one generation and 10 generations later, the family is still absurdly wealthy. Uh, and the next nine generations haven't done anything other than inherit. Um, yeah. That needs to change. And, and, and that's uh, when you start looking at the billionaires and those at the very top in wealth in the United States, a significant percentage of them didn't do anything in particular to, uh, to earn that money, did they? Quite a few haven't, but I, I think if you look ahead 30 years, it's scary where you have, uh, you know, a billionaire with, say, 20 or 30 or billion dollars of, of wealth and it just goes to the next generation through creative planning or mostly goes and then just continues to accumulate because I mean these people have the best money managers in the world working for them and so we could wake up you know 30 years from now and have I wrote a, an article on this trillionaire trust fund babies where um, you know Paris Hilton, instead of having, you know, tens of millions in trust for her, has a trillion dollars in trust for her. Um, it's, it's really kind of crazy stuff, um, but it, it's, it, it's, it's absolutely where we're headed if we don't do something to stop it. For, for those of us who don't have anything uh, similar to that, Bob Lord, and, and who can't even imagine what a trillion dollars looks like, how, how do you get a, a trillion dollar trust? Where does that come from when nobody uh, yet, for the moment, has got a trillion dollars piled up? Well, actually, the, the fortunes of today's billionaires are starting to approach that. You know, um, Jeff Bezos, in a couple of years ago was divorced uh, and they split up their, their assets, I think three fourths for him and one fourth for her. Just say hypothetically, they stayed together. They would have about a quarter trillion dollars of wealth right now. Elon Musk is on a path to have a trillion dollars of wealth in the next decade or so. And, and just so people understand how much wealth that is. Jeff Bezos is worth a little under $200 billion right now. If you, David, had arrived with Columbus in the West Indies in 1492, and you were still alive today, and you had started out the day after you arrived adding $1 million per day every day for the last 529 years to your wealth, you would be just about equal to Bezos right now. Yeah, but, but if, Paris if Hilton already a, has a trillion, huh? No, no, no. Paris Hilton, I don't know what her what's in trust for her, but um, <laughs> the 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 I'm talking thirty years from now, what yeah, these okay. trusts will look like. Um, the um, if if you wanted to be just a billionaire and you got here in 1492, well, then you'd only have to add five thousand dollars a day day in, day out for 528 years. These are phenomenal sums of money that no family could ever need for the next 10 generations. Yeah, in incredible to me. Um, 
what what about what about corporations uh all the corporations that used to be more heavily taxed uh and all the corporations that reportedly are not paying a dime uh in taxes uh is that a not a is that not a place to go after for for the wealth that's needed for useful things oh i think it is and and i think the i think the biden administration is headed there that was the giant tax cut in, from Trump in 2017, where they reduced the corporate tax rate from 35% down to 21% in one fell swoop. That's a that's a 40% tax cut from one year to the next. Um, and I think the I think the Biden plan is to is to restore about half of that tax rate to bring it back up to 28%. It gets a little tricky because these corporations can. Uh, can move. Uh, they can uh, they can become uh, French corporations or German corporations or Cayman Islands corporations where the you know the the rates really low. Um, so there has to be it's, it's there's a lot of work to do to make sure the tax can't be avoided um, by uh, by the corporations expatriating, but it but it can be done. Yeah. And, and the next step really is for the, the developed countries to to get together and uh, together stop this, uh, not not enter into this competition, uh, which really is a race to the bottom where each country is trying to cut its corporate tax rate to, to draw in business. Yeah, disastrous. Um, and, and what about a more progressive income tax uh, system? Uh, can we... Can we go there? Is there what are the chances uh, with uh, Joe keep the filibuster in place? Biden going there? <laughs> uh, well, if we keep the filibuster in, I guess I guess you could keep the filibuster in place if you're trying to raise income tax rates because that can be done through something called budget reconciliation, where the filibuster doesn't apply. As you many know, the, things could have been done in recent weeks, right? If they if there were anybody <laughs> willing to do them, right? Right. Um, the the top individual tax rate now is 37 percent. Back in the Eisenhower administration, I think it was 91 percent. Yeah. I don't know if you need to go to 91 percent, but certainly if someone's already and we're dealing with marginal rates, we're not dealing with the first dollar you earn taxed at that amount. This is where you get above a certain amount and, and each additional dollar is taxed at a at a higher amount. You know, if someone's already, you know, Put away, you know, two three million dollars in income in one year. Shouldn't the next dollar after that be taxed a lot more heavily than thirty seven percent? I mean, is it, do do we really want these fortunes to keep accumulating, or do we want to uh, allow everybody to benefit? Yeah, and and there you could also get rid of the cap on social security taxes, right? So that the super wealthy don't pay social security tax only on the first teeny tiny bit of their income. Right, and they're also social security taxes now are uh, only applied to uh, to wage income. They're not a, well. They're they're applied. A, well, no, the social security taxes are only applied to wage income. So should they apply? to other forms of income, dividend income, interest income, rental income, and so forth. Yeah, a lot of money out there to be had. Um, what about, uh, to, to stray wildly from the Biden administration, what about the idea of moving a teeny bit of money out of militarism uh, as a source of funding government uh, and, and maybe actually lowering taxes on ordinary non-mega wealthy people? Uh, this seems to be, off the agenda, but I hear about, you know, these guys may get to a trillion in wealth someday, and I see a trillion being flushed down the war machine every single year, another trillion, another trillion. Uh, is, isn't that, I mean, why, why does it always have to be, we'll just raise taxes on something, uh, which of course, the media uses to scare everybody because they 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 get the impression it's going to be raising taxes on them. Uh, what about moving money within government as a source of funding things? Well, you know, if you if you add to the the Pentagon budget 
related things like the, uh, the VA uh, to care for veterans and so forth, we're right around a trillion dollars a year on military spending, uh, which is, it's, a, it's an unbelievable amount. I mean, the last I saw it was equal to like the next 20 some countries combined and how much we spend every year. And the, the statistics about where we have uh, service personnel stationed, I think it's like 60 or 70 countries. The number of bases we have strewn around the globe is some, some ridiculous number like 800. Um, of course, you know, look, uh, every kind of dominant civilization reaches a point similar to where we are and ultimately they have to pull back. Um, and the, the, the British were, were in a comparable position in the first half of the, of the 20th century uh, and, and they had to cut back. It'll be time for America to cut back and it, 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 really the sooner we do it, probably the better. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, it should have long since been done. Uh, how, so how this is something I think you've researched and written about how exactly do billionaires and the super wealthy or at least those of them who, who take a part uh, in it prevent the Congress from taxing them more? How do they uh, how is it that Congress members end up working for this very small percentage of their supposed constituents? Well, <laughs> I think it's uh, campaign finance is the first place to look. Um, this is a, this number is old, so it may have gotten worse since then, but this top 0.01% that we were talking about, the last time I saw something on it, they had funded 25% of all campaign contributions. Um, this one ten thousandth of the population is putting 25% of the campaign contributions in. And that was, I think, before um the citizens united uh really took hold where these so-called super PACs are, are able to take millions at a time uh from individual contributors so that's probably gotten worse if anything and then the other thing that the so they, they have they have a gigantic voice uh the other thing they have going is they have just their own private staffs uh, to manage the wealth. Uh, there's things called family offices, private trust companies. Uh, it's what's called the wealth defense industry. My colleague Chuck Collins has written about this. He has a book coming out, in fact, I think in the next week or two called Wealth Hoarders. And it's about how, the, about how this industry takes the wealth of billionaires and and, and, and almost billionaires, uh, really, I'd say about wealth of 30 or 40 million and up. Um, you know, we, we talk about this and it makes 30 million sound small, but someone worth $30 million is, is exorbitantly wealthy. Um, anyhow, they, this, this industry uh, sh shelters the, 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 the high-end wealth. They, they create tax shelters for it. They create trusts that are very, very difficult to reach if, a, if one of these folks get, gets into a, a legal problem. And they keep a bunch of it offshore where folks don't even know about it. Uh, there's, a, there's a good bit of, of hidden wealth. Uh, and it's, it's not your wealth or mine that's hidden. It's the folks at the top. Short of... Short of criminalizing bribery and publicly financing campaigns and so forth. What do you make of this legislation that's in Congress now, Bill Number 1, H.R. 1 and S. 1, that would, as I understand it, allow the contributions, as we call them, to continue flowing, even increase, but let everybody play uh, an equal part uh, in who gets money uh, through through campaign contributions of a, of a smaller but more numerous uh, variety. Um, do I have that right? And do you think it could succeed? You may know more about that legislation than I do, at least that part of it. Um, I, I know that HR1, the, the parts that kind of restore voting rights, 
for huge sure. swaths of the population. This is where I think your comments about the filibuster are spot on. Uh, to, to allow that legislation to not succeed because of the filibuster is political malpractice on the part of the Democratic Party. Um, this is, this is, you know, we've got a, you know, these are new Jim Crow laws that are being passed in a bunch of states where they're basically making it virtually impossible for people of color to vote, uh, or at least making it very, very difficult. And there's, there's just no way that um, this policy that's been in place forever, the filibuster, should be allowed to, to, to prevent the folks on our side from doing something about that. Um, elections really haven't been fair for a long time here. There's been a lot of vote suppression. What we saw happen in 2020 was just a fantastic effort to, to, to partially overcome the vote suppression. But if we fully overcame the vote suppression, that margin that Biden won by would have been a lot bigger. Yeah, I, I, I wish I were confident there were people on my side. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced uh, there isn't one group that wants the filibuster and another group that wants to look as if they don't want the filibuster. Um, but I would be, I would be delighted to be proved wrong on that if you know some way to, <laughs> to do it. What, I. Uh... I, I hope you're wrong about that, but I'm not. I don't. I'm not confident enough to bet against you. <laughs> we've we've got just about a minute left, Bob. Lord, what can what can people do and uh, to stay informed about your work and to move these issues in the right direction? You know, really, it's it, it is staying informed. It's putting pressure on on senators and representatives when the time comes for uh, for votes, and and that's right now as far as the filibuster is concerned. Um, and, um, and just doing the, the organizing work of getting people to the polls the next time around, because this, this election in 2022 is going to be critical. Uh, the, 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 if anything really, really good is going to happen, the Democrats have to expand their majorities. I, I hope you're right, and I hope it comes to pass. Uh, Bob Lord is uh, doing terrific work at the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, a wonderful organization that employed uh, the great Steve Cobble, whom we recently lost, uh, but whose influence I hope will last for many, many years. Um, I will put up links at talkworldradio.org to Bob Lord's work at, at IPS. Bob, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk Nation, Talk World Radio. Thanks, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.